In no particular order, Ellis Marsalis, Wynton Marsalis, Steps Ahead, Stanley Clark, Dave Douglas, Michael Brecker. These are some of the people who my guest Clarence Penn has played with over the years and made music with. Clarence and I got a chance to sit down and just chop it up in New York a few months back. Really excited to share it with you. If you're digging what I'm doing here on the channel, I'd love for you to like and subscribe, ring the little notification bell right down there. Thanks for checking it out. I think you're gonna love this one. Here it comes. Thanks for doing it. Yeah, dude. Definitely. This is a great idea that you, you had. I was yeah. happy to, when I came out to hear you play last night and, and we were talking a little bit and um, you were saying that you, you watch, you're watching a bunch of <laughs> <laughs> music, YouTube stuff, drum yeah. stuff. I, That's true. Yeah. I, you know, I kind of went down the rabbit hole and kind of became obsessed with all the stuff that was going on and there's a few people doing stuff that I love. Mm. But like I was saying to you last night, like I'm kind of more interested in talking to like like what, what it is to pursue it as a career and, and what that means your life is about on a day-to-day -day mm. basis and, mm. and all that. But let's start kind of at the beginning and, uh, <laughs> you know. The first instrument I played was trumpet. Oh, you um, did? It lasted for about a week, just the pain, you know, with the armature mm -hmm. and all that stuff. I was like, wait, this is not gonna be, you know, fun. And you could have been in a section with Genus. He, he could have been on trombone and the, well, everything I, could have been different. Well, yeah, everything could have, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I probably wouldn't have been in New York. I'd probably be an accountant. And then I, I switched over to drums because my neighbor played. And then, you know, just the joy I got from playing drums, I figured early on that it would be a great queer path to go down. And, uh, and I kind of went on that path from being at Interlochen Arts Academy, which was a, a classical high school or uh, arts high school. And I was a classical percussion major there and then going to University of Miami for a year and I was a classical percussion slash drum set major. And then going to VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University, where Ellis Marcellus was. And that was my second year of college. And at that point, it was like, I was just like, okay, I just want to be a jazz musician 100%, yeah. You know. My father was still saying, like, what do you mean jazz musician? Like, when are you going to get a real job? But, yeah. You but know. you knew young that you knew that that was, like, what you were going to do? I knew that it was important to me. I knew that I got a, a lot of um, joy. It felt right, you know? It just felt like, you know, when I would be behind the drum set. And I wasn't good or anything, but it just felt like home, you know? It felt very, very comfortable. What kind of music were you listening to when you were a kid? I'm talking um, before you, you got in, before college, before you started Before studying. college, I listened to, man, I liked The Police a lot. We used to, you know, we had like a mock band. We were playing like The Police. Because I like Stuart Copeland, you know, I like that. Okay. Um, being from Detroit, Motown was big in, in our house. So my mother, we did have a you know, record player. My parents gave a lot of parties. So, you know, Sam Cooke. Marvin Gaye. Actually, I went to school right down the street from Motown, the original Motown. Oh, so really? my first high school in Detroit was probably two or three blocks, and that building is still there, Hitsville, yeah. USA. So that was in the house a lot. Uh, my mother liked a lot of blues, you know, so that was played a lot. And actually, the jazz radio station in Detroit, they weren't, it, it wasn't, now that I know what jazz is, they weren't playing jazz. So I was okay. listening to that, you know. What were they and playing? And it was like, you know, fusion. It was like, you know, it was like Yellow Jackets, or it'd be like Jean Luponti. So oh, it was really? like, you know. And then, so what are we talking about? Like, are we talking, you're talking 80s? 80s, yeah, yeah, mid 80s, something like that. I thought that was jazz. And then when I met Wynton Marcellus for the first time in 10th grade, he came to my high school and we were playing a song with him. I was in the big band and, and my song got chosen um, as the one that went and wanted to play. And what do you mean your song, a song that you had written? Because there were two drummers in the band, two or three drummers in the band. And so, in, in, you know, with two or three drummers, yeah, we had our songs that we played. And um, I think mine was Night in Tunisia or something like that. And, you know, went and wanted to play Night in Tunisia. And I'm playing, and what I'm playing is like a beat that I had heard on the jazz radio station, which was actually played like fusion, you right, know. Right, and right. like, and so I'm playing like this kind of pseudo funk beat behind, uh -huh. and, and went and turns around, you know, in front of the, the the whole school, like almost like 
the, we did an assembly. And he turned around, he's like, man, what are you playing? And I'm like, man, I'm playing, I'm playing the groove. He's like, man, that's not the groove. He said, have you ever heard of Art Blakey? And I kind of, yeah, I heard of Art Blakey a little bit. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, a little bit. He's like, well, play me something that Art Blakey would play. And I was just like, well, I can't do that because I, I haven't studied out. So Winton takes the drumsticks from me in front of like, you know, hundreds of students. He takes the sticks, sits down behind the drum set. And, you know, he's not a drummer, but he plays some. Right, shows that's, you the yeah, vibe. Right? Yeah, he knew. He, and oh, I was it's just, just so like, uncomfortable as you're telling me this. I was completely <laughs> embarrassed. I was embarrassed and like, you know, a trumpet player. And it's in front of all my friends and everybody's like, oh, you know, like he's showing you up. But at the same time, I was like, man, it's incredible that this guy plays trumpet and he can play something on the drums that I can't. Right. And so I was like, well, how could that be? So, you know, after the, the embarrassing moment, after that, I went and talked to him on, a, on the side. And I was like, man, how do I learn how to do what you're doing? And he was just like, man, you got to, he gave me a whole list of drummers and people to, to check to out. To. And that was kind of my path from that point, because I respected him. He was in, de in town playing with the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, but then like, on another night he played his jazz quartet. Right. So he was doing both, and that was the first time I ever seen, you know, anyone, let alone an African-American, with suit, dress well, spoke very, you know, like, elegantly, and, and uh, you know, just everything, the whole package. I was like, man, I want to be like that guy. And, and so from that point, from 10th grade, I made him my, my just mentor, you know. Every time he came to town, I would be in touch with him. And I remember talking kind of, about that with you yeah. Yeah, a couple of years ago. And so he, you know, he, he stayed up with you, or you he stayed did. up with him, yeah. and he, he was yeah. receptive. He, and, yeah. You know, every time he came to town, I made sure that I go to, to the show. I made sure I got some advice. But he was the type of, he is the type of guy that uh, I think he had tough love growing up. Like, either you want to do it or you don't want to do it, you mm -hmm. know. And so that's how he taught me, you know. Um, and friends of mine were like, you know, why do you go to his concerts if he's like always telling you what you can't play or what you, you know, like how bad you are. But I knew it was something there that I was supposed to get. I think you can't learn something until you're humbled by it. And, and then once you just let that go, then you can start to soak in all of the stuff that you're supposed to learn. And I was like, man, this guy has something. He's already in a position. I know there's something for me to, to learn there. Yeah. And yeah, every time he came to town, even at Miami, I was at University of Miami, and that first year, I didn't necessarily love the program because it was more of a fusion program. Mm. And it was a jazz, but it was jazz fusion. And I, I was really trying to learn about Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Charlie Parker, you know, the stuff Winton was, was into, Miles. Mm. And I saw Winton, I went to a concert, he was playing in West Palm Beach, I still remember it clearly. I drove up to West Palm Beach, and got, you know, backstage passes, and, and he was like, so how's it going here? And I was like, man, I don't like it. It's like this and that. And he says, you should go study with my father. And I was like, where? Um, and he was like, he's in Richmond. I was like, Rich what? What? Richmond, Virginia. And that was not on my, my sure. you know, because coming from Interlochen, you auditioned for New England Conservatory, uh, Juilliard, all the top music schools, and VCU right, right. was not a big music school. Right. It was a very small school in Richmond. I mean, not very small, but small school in Richmond. And uh, I said, okay, I'll, I'll check it out. And just my luck, Ellis was playing in Detroit a month and a half later with Branford and Lewis, mm. Lewis Nash. They, and, uh, you know, by me being friends with Winton, he, get, he got me tickets to, to get backstage to talk to his father. Right. And I was like, Winton told me to come study with you. And he was like, great, okay, here's the school, and you know, send your audition to whatever, yeah. you know, come in. And I went down and, and auditioned like a week before school started. And they had already given away, you know, all the dorms and all that, but they gave, they, they wanted me, so they gave me a full scholarship to come down. Nice. And, uh, so but I didn't have, have a place been, to stay. But you must have already been playing I pretty guess, good yeah. at this point. I mean, I had, I had, I guess I had some talent, I guess, yeah, yeah. I had, well, I mean, you'd, you'd studied classical, yeah, so studied, you could yeah. read. Yeah, I could read and, and I was playing, yeah. And you had drum set lessons somewhere along the way, like yeah, so yeah, you I mean, your, yeah. getting your rudiments together yeah. and all of that stuff. At Miami, I mean, at Miami, I was practicing literally during the week, six to eight hours a day, I was on the drums and then on the weekends, I'd be there 10 hours, I just wouldn't leave the room. So, I mean, like, I could physically play the drum set and, you know, I was learning more about jazz too, so I could kind of play jazz right. yeah, at, at that time. So obviously I had some talent or else they wouldn't have given me a full scholarship. 
It's but amazing, it was amazing, man. What's interesting to me and what's so beautiful about it is like that openness that is part of what he does is, you know, he's going to take somebody young under his wing a little bit or give yeah. it. But it also, it also takes a certain kind of personality, like, you know, to be able to see that as helpful because he's, exactly. he's a tough dude. Exactly. Yeah. No. I remember, you know, definitely instances where I should have, you know, I would have just like walked away. But I mean, to this day, I'm, I'm just very grateful for that. And I mean, actually the way that I teach is the same way that I learned. I'm like, you know, I tell my students, if you really want this, then you'll put the time in, you'll listen to what I have to offer. And, um, and so, then, so then you go and you start studying with Alice and um, what'd you get from that? How did that change your approach to music? Well, when I got to VCU, I was still practicing a lot. And Ellis noticed that, you know, he would check me out. Oh, do you see that I'm putting time in? I was doing a lot of transcriptions. I was really serious about jazz. So I was, I really, you know, put my teeth into it. I was really doing all that, all that work. And then about three months, three, four months after being there, Ellis says, hey, man, I got some gigs that I'd like you to do. With him? With him. You know, I'd like you to play in my trio. And I was just like, whoa, really? You know, that was amazing. I was just like playing with Ellis Marcellus. You know, the Marcellus is already like that name. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, he, he took me on the road. And I was like, oh, man, this is going to be like great. I'm going to have girls. I'm going to have, it's just going to be great. The yeah, because girls play, love Ellis you Marcellus. Know, you know, <laughs> just jazz, just, yeah, you know. And, and we get on the, on the plane and, and uh, I'm sitting across from Ellis. And Ellis pulls out this thick Bach book of Bach chorales. And he says, here you go, get to work. And I'm like, what? He said, what do you thought this was gonna be like, you know, just fun and games out here? If you're away from school, you're gonna be analyzing. He wanted me to analyze the Bach chorales. He wanted me to start, you know, arranging, start writing. Like, it was like, it was full on. So I, I wasn't expecting that, but it was great. You know, now that I look back on it, but um, yeah, it wasn't, I thought it was going to be fun. I mean, it was fun, but it wasn't like party, party central. You that know? comes later. Yeah, that came later. <laughs> but. I think um, Ellis is the type of teacher that he won't tell you exactly what to do, but he will present options or kind of lead you to certain places and he wants you to make that that step he's not going to say you know you have to do this you have to do that but he'll definitely put these ideas up there and and get you get the wheels to, to rolling you know because i didn't i didn't even want to finish graduate uh, finish school i didn't want to graduate i was like ellis i'm ready to move to new york i just want to go to new york and start playing and he was like man you should just stay and get your degree new york is going to be there but you know, if you walk away from the university, you're probably not gonna take the time to return it and finish the degree. You so know? you get out of college. Well, yeah, well, I graduated in May, right? Uh -huh. And uh, took this job, weird job in Greenbrier, West Virginia. West Virginia. In West Virginia. So we don't need to elaborate on <laughs> West Virginia. So, <laughs> but you know, I took it because. I, so I, would, I, was, I was in a band and I could play five days a week and save okay. up enough because I knew I wanted to move to New York. And uh, I had been working there uh, for about, I don't know, maybe three weeks a month. And I got the call from a great guy named Louis Nash, a great drummer. And he says, Betty Carter's looking for a drummer. So I gave her your name. And I was like, wow, man, that's amazing. And so when Betty calls, she's just, uh, you know, Louis Nash is my favorite drummer. He recommended you. So I want you to come up and join the band, like without audition. And um, I packed up the truck, drove up to New York. I called Betty and I was like, I'm here. And she's like, you're where? And I'm like, I'm at my apartment. She says, why are you at your apartment? We're, we're rehearsing right now at my apartment. You need to be over here. And I was like, oh, OK, sorry. So you get to New York and that's it. You're on, that was, you're, yeah, you're, 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 you're on a, a proper jazz gig. Keep it going. Clarence Penn on 
That was on, that was on the best get jazz gig. That was, for a young musician, that was the best gig to have. Because Betty Carter was so famous, she toured all the time. Right. You know, and you could play, you're playing every night. And you're playing, you know, you could play pretty hard. You could, you know, it, um, she definitely required you to be playing at your highest level every single night. And now did, now was it starting to get fun? You didn't have to do the, the Bach chorales on the I didn't have to do the Bach. <laughs> It got fun, the first tour, like, so we rehearsed for three or four days, and then I went to California for like three weeks. So that tour was like pretty amazing. I had never been to California. Mm -hmm. You know, we played LA, we did uh, San Diego, San Francisco. It was just like, you know, it was just great. You know, sunshine. We did three weeks, and then we came back home for about four or five days, and then we went to Europe for six weeks of one-nighters. That wasn't fun, because for six weeks, we're packing the bag, you know, changing hotels, airports for you know, six weeks, a different place every night. You yeah. know? I think we had two days off in six weeks. Back then, all the, all the tours were on trains for the most part. We'd fly, if it was a big distance, we'd do a plane and then go to a train station to take, you know, so, you know, it was my first time in Europe. I overpacked, huge suitcase, not knowing. I remember we got to Poland. I was in Warsaw for the first time. And uh, me and a piano player, we went to the post office, we, were like, we had to send a bag of clo clothing home. And the guy at the post office was like, it's gonna take three or four weeks for it to get home. We're like, well, we're here for six weeks, so yeah, it's just send it. But it, in general, it was, it was fun, you know? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily trade it, you know? Yeah. And then from Betty, I got the gig, or the reason why I left her is because Stanley Clark had hired me. Right. And, and so then. This, the Stanley Clark thing is an entirely different stylistically. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, it was kind of fusion again. When I got the gig with Stanley, I remember Stanley saying, I want every drum you can find. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know. And so how, did, how did you play. get the gig? Because, you know, like, I wouldn't necessarily think that, like, yeah, he would Stanley go, Clark yeah, would, would be like want Betty the Carter. dude who's getting the Betty, the Betty Carter gig. Um, Lenny White, who yeah. played Sam, um, knew me from playing with Betty and seen me do gigs around town. So, like, you know, being, a, uh, being on a New York jazz scene, I was doing gigs with Betty, but then and somebody else called you. Yeah, and so he, he heard me do another a fusion gig, and uh, so he, you know, he thought I could play everything, and I, I, I thought I could play, you know, a pretty wide range of music. And he's like, "Man, what are you doing?" I was like, "Oh yeah, I'm at the Blue Note with Betty Carter." And he's like, "Man, I was just telling Stanley about you. Would you be into that?" And I was like, "Man, Stanley Clark, sure, definitely." You know, so he passed my information on. And uh, Stanley's wife at the time called me, and she says, well, Stanley's in Japan. Um, is there a way that you can record yourself and, and, and send it to me? And so this is pre- uh, yeah, like, any of How am I gonna record we, myself? So, yeah, I went and got a cassette. I had a cassette player, and went to my practice room, uh -huh. and just played some grooves and, you know, and I FedExed it to Stanley's wife. And Stanley's wife got it. Stanley's on the phone. She's playing the cassette for him on the phone, and that's how I got the gig. He was just like, he heard it, he was like, okay, tell him he got it. Was that really exciting, or did it make sense to you? Like, was it like, yeah, oh yeah, now I'm, now I'm now it's Stanley Clark. Were you like, holy shit, man, yeah. Stanley Clark. You know, I was nervous because I was in, in the 90s, the, the scenes were really separate. It was a Winton school, right. let's say the Winton school. And then there was, a, you know, the funk school, then you had the jazz, uh, the fusion. So it was really it was very separate. It wasn't so cats doing, time. like now, musicians, especially drummers, play everything, which is great. But back then... It was really looked down yeah. upon, from, especially from the, from the jazz world yes, into the exactly. fusion world. It was like, so I was nervous. I was nervous from that, because Winton had been my mentor up until this, this point. And I was still in touch with him. He knew I was playing with Betty, and yeah, I wanted him to be proud of me, and, you know. But then, you know, I got this thing with Stanley, and I was just like... But Stanley yeah. is also a legendary cat. You yeah, know what but I mean? still, He's the jazz cats still, you know, like, I think the hardcore jazz cats were still, like, yeah. 
Right, electric bass, whatever. Yeah, yeah, you know. But I thought it was a normal progression in that I did, I played everything. I, you know, I tried to play. I love r and I like fusion, I love jazz, I love whatever. Yeah. You know, and um, so when I got the gig, I was scared of what the New York guys were gonna, were gonna think, but you know, when I got to California, I wanted the California cats to be like, I wanted it to sound authentic. I didn't want to get the gig with Stanley and guys be like, yeah, it sounds like a jazz kid playing, you know. I wanted to sound the part, I wanted to, you know. And um, so when I got to LA, you know, I, I really got into that and tried to, you know, do oh, the so part. Oh, so that was LA, so that was like That was in LA, yeah, yeah. And, you know, when I got the gig with Stanley Clark, I told Dennis Chambers, who's great Dennis Chambers, and, and I called him up and I was like, man, I got the gig. And he's like, great, here's the number, call this guy at the, the drum company. So at that point, I, the drum companies weren't necessarily interested in giving me an endorsement with the jazz gigs that I was doing. But then when I got to Stanley's thing, oh, oh, that they were kind just of like, up, yeah. they were just like, you know, oh, Stanley, okay, yeah. Who did so, you well, get tell set us up what with, do you then, need? Like with Yamaha at that I got time? Uh, Pearl. And they were great. I called them and it was just like, yeah, what do you, what do you need? If Dennis recommended you, what do, what do you need? And um, you know, tell us where to send it. I go from a jazz kit, which is one bass drum, one tom, one floor tom, mm -hmm. two cymbals, to like double bass drum, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16 toms, seven cymbal stands, a gong, you know, like chimes, you know, like, cause Stanley said, he every, said even, everything. even electric drums. I mean, he took me to, what was it, Sam, whatever, some good, whatever the shop was. He's just like, yeah, hey, what about this electric? So I was playing electric triggers and, so it and was then you're really like, surreal. You know, kid in the candy store, right? Yeah, it's like exactly. when, when they're like, yeah, you can have whatever you want. Exactly. And you're like, I'll take all the drugs. Yeah. I was like, yeah, that. what about that? And yeah. were you even, was there any transition to even being comfortable behind a kit like that? Because you weren't really accustomed to playing that the, kind of setup. The biggest uh, adjustment was going from not being technical, but I, I was a traditional player, so I would hold the drumstick like this and this way. But Stanley played so loud. <laughs> right. So you, it would. It would just. I was having so much pain trying to play loud. On it. So I went to to match grip. So that was a big adjustment, even body wise. You know, even because of Betty, everything the volume was down and. It was do a you even, kind do of you even like kind of strike the heads a little bit different? Because like you're probably going from like coated to clear type of vibe, um, like kind of more rock. I think I kept clear. I think I kept coated heads on. I think. So it would have been whatever Dennis was playing, I guess, yeah, yeah. 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 for that. Um, but yeah, the, the, and the double aspect bass, is and again, completely the different. And again, the double bass is a different yeah, thing too. Completely. Actually, to be honest, I had a double bass and a small jazz bass drum. So I had three bass drums happening. So, and you know, because Stanley would, during the set, he would do a jazz, like he'd do a couple jazz tunes. So we're like, and then the next tune, you know, I just shift my seat and then like, I had so many drums I could do it, like a little jazz bass drum here. And I, you know, mm -hmm. it, was, it was pretty interesting. <laughs> there was only three of us, right, and we true. made a lot of noise. Yeah. You know, I mean, for three people, the sound was huge. You know, Stanley yeah. had a wall of amps, Darren had a wall of amps, I had like a wall of drums, so for three people, you know. I mean, I couldn't have ever imagined something like that. I mean, with Stanley, we went to uh, Europe for six weeks. That was my first tour bus, and uh, we had a tour bus, and you know, Stanley's a big star, and you know, we did a lot of Germany, Austria, France, you know, and every show was sold out. And you know, for me, it was great because it was a completely different audience than I had with Betty Carter, and I played with Betty Carter two and a half years, so. But with Stanley, it was just like all of a sudden this fusion rock kind of crowd. And I was like, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. and we came out and, you know, it was the first time that I had a, a drum tech, our own sound man, because right. we Betty. It was Betty, this piano player, the bass player, and me playing drums. We never had a manager traveling with us or whatever, and we carried our own stuff. I set up my drums every night and, you know, and uh, with Stanley, it was like completely different. Yeah, but then from Stanley's thing, I, I got the gig with Steps Ahead. They heard me play with Stanley. Right. And so, you know. Steps Ahead was a big thing at that time. Steps Ahead too. was big, yeah. And that, you know, and that was, it was, it's funny. So I go from a straight ahead jazz thing 
um, with Betty, and then I go to like a super fusion thing with Stanley. Then Steps Ahead is kind of like a marriage of both because when I got the gig with Steps Ahead, I thought they were going to be doing all the fusion stuff from all the hits, but he really wanted to to, to teeter more on jazz and fusion. So it was it was kind of like a logical step for me to kind of go back and like marry the two my last and, five and did years. You, did you get any shade from the cats in New York when you came back? Like, oh man, that cat's dead. You know, I you thought know? I was no, but you know. Uh, actually, I went, I went to the Vanguard right after Stanley's tour and, and went and was at the Vanguard. And I was nervous, you know, I was in my 20s. I was so nervous to, to see him because I thought he was going to be like, man, you sold out or you did this. And, and he looks at me, uh, they were walking off the stage. He says, man, I, I hear you, man. You drummers, man, you guys can play anything. You got to do what you got to do. And I was like, you know, that was him for me. That was like him giving, you know, like the blessing of, I was always, I think of the mindset that music is music, so you just kind of just yeah. play and, 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 and hopefully be honest and, and uh, be respectful of the idiom and try to, to play it correctly, you know, try, not try to force something on top of that. Yeah, that, I mean, that actually brings me to something I, I was thinking about, uh, talking about, I was thinking about it a lot when I was listening to the band last night, because when I came out to hear you with Dave Douglas and playing the music of... Booker Little, Booker who I had not been familiar with, but like it was a real traditional thing, and you guys all played it so proper, <laughs> you know. And I was, I was wondering, is that is do you stay cognizant of sort of where you fit in, sort of in the fabric of of jazz, in in the legacy of it? Like, do you do you make an effort to stay, you know, to stay true to it, to push it forward, to, or or is you know, do you think about that in any way? Because I'll say one thing, I mean, because to, to me, I see you as part of that lineage, man. You know, I mean, especially, I mean, you've, you've obviously at this point, you know, we just touched on a couple, but we could go through the whole career, but you've, you know, you've worked with all, mm. so many artists and, um, you know, you're a part of what's happening in, in, that, in that line of jazz. I, know, I mean, I, I definitely, I don't see it that way. I've, yeah, I feel like a, a, just a beginning student. I, at, still at this point, I mean, it's so, like when you think of jazz and like, like the masters, I mean, I guess they felt that way too, but I just feel like I got so far to, to go. So in the situation last night, it's interesting that you got somebody like Charles Tolliver, who's, you know, upper 70s, if not 80. Then you got Riley, who's clearly early, late 20s or early 30s. Right. Then you got Dave Douglas, who's in his mid 50s. So like the, the, the it's, a, it's a long, yeah. you know. And I was noticing and so, that myself. And I was like, and I thought that was beautiful to yeah. me. I was like, this is, this is what it is. Man. Yeah. This is what, this is a. Yeah, I mean, and, and for, for me, it's, um, it's fun in that if you notice, I, I play different behind each solo. So I feel, yeah. yeah, I could be more modern behind Riley. But with Charles, I hear that tone, I automatically just snap into, like, he was just reminding me of Miles or, you know, I just, it's just this traditional. With Dave, I know Dave is very modern, so, like, you know, for me, it's like I'm, I'm switching hats within the same song. So it's, it's fun for me, you know, but it's still under the, the, the guise of, of traditional jazz, you know, right. the, the, the foundation is there. And Charles said it last night after the gig, he was like, man, colors, I love that. And like, and, and like how you just like switch up. And yeah. I mean, it's great to hear that from somebody of, you know, his stature, you know, give me a compliment like that. You know, it makes me feel good when I know that the musician next to me is listening to what I play. You know, if I play something and, and they, they even eye contact or they, you know, and it didn't have, like you say, it didn't have to happen instantly. But, right. you know, it, it makes you feel supported. It makes you feel like we're in this together as opposed to you just listen to me and I'm just going to play everything, you know? And so, um, yeah, with, with, with every soloist, I mean, I listen intently, you know, um, to what they play. And, yeah, I may use it early or I may use it later. But I just want them to feel that 100% support of I'm I'm with you. Whatever you play, you know, you yeah. want to bring it down. You want to go up. You want to, you know, yeah. yeah. It's like driving a car or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. 
So at some point, after you've been playing with a lot of artists, recorded with a lot of artists, um, at some point you decide to do your own thing, to be a leader, to put your own group together, to make your own records. Yeah. How did, I mean, how did that come about? You know, um, wow, about, it's funny, about 20, no, yeah, maybe 20 years ago, I was playing in New York at a place called Visiones. A representative from Blue Note came down, was like, yeah, we're looking to, we think we want to sign a drummer, and we think you would be, you know, um, a good person to, to be, you know, to sign to Blue Note. And I was like, wow, I mean, I would definitely be into it. It was between me and, uh, me and a couple other guys, and, um, and then for whatever reason, Blue Note ended up signing uh, somebody, somebody else. But that didn't stop me from writing. The drummer's best friend, I've always thought was the piano. You know, that's the only, the best way for me to, to get, you know, what's in my, in my head down in a harmonic way. But so when you decided to do your first record, did you feel like it was like a creative decision where it was like, man, I have this music that I want to get out and I want to try to do something my way and do something different than what I've been doing? Or was it sort of a career angle like, man, hmm. I got to make my thing and put my music out and lead my own band? I wish it was that way. It probably it should have been that way. But um, so if I'm not mistaken, the first record I did was on Criss Cross, mm -hmm. the famous Criss Cross jazz label. Um, out of Holland, and the guy came to me and said, yeah, I'd like you to do a, a record. And uh, so I had these tunes from when I was, you know, actually the, some of the tunes I played on my senior recital mm -hmm. in college, and some new tunes also. And uh, so when he said, I want you to do a record, I had the material. It was just of me, it was just about finding the, the right guys. Um, and at the time, couldn't think of a piano player or, or, you know, it was just I didn't have a piano player. So the first record is drums, bass, sax, and trumpet. Okay. It was actually one of my more known records. And it was really fun. We did it at this, this studio called RPM. And uh -huh. they used to be down in, in the, uh, the village. And the sound is absolutely amazing. And people come to me all the time and say, the sound of that first record, where were you? It was the studio that's now condos. but. Um, yeah, so that my first record didn't come about with me like really conceptualizing, oh, God, I gotta do a record. It kind of came your it way. Came, yeah, it kind of came, you know. When you began the, the process of doing that record, did you, did you approach it from the standpoint of I wanna showcase my drumming and this is a drum record or was it just like? No, I think I wanted to showcase my writing. I wanted to, cause I had these tunes and, and I thought I was a pretty good writer. So I really wanted to showcase that aspect um, with that first record. You know, I, I think sometimes with drummers, they, they feel like they have to do a, a record and then like every solo, every song has to have a solo on it or a drum intro or this, you know. My thing is more that I want to kind of provide a, a palette or like, you know, I want to be in the mix. I, I don't mm -hmm. want to just be about me. Right. Well, me is making everybody else feel comfortable, yeah. in, in my opinion. And did you, did you tour and support that record? I didn't. I didn't start touring and supporting records in, until my last record, which was oh, the, Monk, the Monk record. The Monk record. Um, and I think up until that point, I was just really busy touring with everybody else and, and didn't have much of a desire to do that or, or I didn't take the opportunity to do that. But then when I did this Monk project, I was really proud of the arrangements, uh, proud of how it sounded. Um, and when it came out, it was in, until 2014, it, it was normal, more normal for drummers to present their, their bands and their music. And, you know, so it just seemed like the timing was right for that. I did, and I did a lot of touring with that. I'm really happy with that project. Yeah, that's yeah. a beautiful one. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so, the, so in that case, you got out and you were performed as? As a leader. As a leader. And I didn't, I didn't really know that I enjoyed it or that it would be that enjoyable. It is stressful yeah. trying to book gigs and deal with you know, everybody in the band, make sure that they're happy and, and trying to be a, a, a good leader. Um, but getting out in front of the band and, and speaking about the songs and about the people in the band, 
you know, I got into it. It feels so good for me. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I love it. Yeah. And to, you know, when you have a great show, everybody's playing great in the band, and a lot of people come out. It just, at the end of the night, just you feel proud. It just, it's the high that you can't, you know. I mean, Miles and all those guys, they had it all the time. But for me, it was, it's pretty, it's pretty new. Yeah. So, you know, I love leading a band. And and when you have a band, it's really convenient that you you can write a song and almost instantly you can perform it or like you, you can get it out whereas if you don't have a band and you oh I got these songs I just don't have anybody to play it yet or I haven't been in a situation where we can get it played so but you and have do a you band. begin to write for the guys in your band exactly. the way the way yeah. they play yeah and when I when I have a band and when we were touring the Monk Project you know I knew we had sound check every day Man, I'd be in a room, I could come up with these ideas and I would just bring sketches down and we play it and then that turned into a tune or, you know. When I'm in it, it's just like, I'm just inspired to do that. Yeah. And then when I'm not touring, then I don't really do it as much, you know, unless I'm kind of working on a, a project, you know. And I'm working on my new project, so, you know, but still trying to find the inspiration to hit it every day, it's kind of hard for me. And there's so many things I wanted to ask you about, and I know that um, amongst the things I know about you are that you are a, you're a disciplined practicer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we were saying off camera, uh -huh. we were saying off camera that you are, to a certain extent, you're known to be able to play complicated music, and so sometimes <laughs> you get the call to play the hard shit. Yeah. Um, are there situations that you go into that you're like intimidated by? Have you have you? been in any situations either because of particular musicians or because of the, the, the music? I mean, if I'm playing difficult music, then I would have prepared or put in the work. So I wouldn't have been intimidated. Like probably some of the more difficult music is that I played has been with Gonzalo Rubacaba, who's a great pianist yeah. from Cuba and a guy named Billy Childs. Mm -hmm. Dude, and due to, Billy's music was hard because I only had like a night to learn it. Like he had a, there was a, a situation with his drummer and he couldn't show up. And he calls me the night before to fly out to California to play his music. And so whereas everybody else in the band, they had weeks or whatever to prepare. I had 24 hours to, to get it together. So, so you're on the plane and with then the it headphones. Was exactly, and making notes and and there was no rehearsal, it was only sound check. I go directly from the airport right to sound check. They're ready, they know the music and, you know, so, um, yeah, if you prepare, then you're not necessarily intimidated. But I do remember one situation when I was early 20s, I was on the road with, let me see, was it Hank Jones or Alice Marcellus? I think it was Alice Marcellus. But the, the issue was, was Alice Marcellus, I was playing with Sweets Edison. Um, it was uh, John Fett. It was like the, the trumpet gods. All the cats. Yeah. And I was in the rhythm section. And that was really intimidating. Because, you know, like I said, it was early 20s. And so the old guys wanted the drums to sound like a, a certain way. And I'm, you know, and I didn't even know if I could, you know, play like, you know, they're hearing Papa Joe, whoever they're, you know, they're, you know, so I was like, really, I, I remember it. There's a video out and it's not too bad, but it's on YouTube. But, uh, you know, playing with those guys, it was just really, you know, let me see. I don't know if Dizzy was on there, but it was like, I mean, it was the top of the top of trumpet players. And for some reason, and we were all playing all straight ahead music, not difficult music. It was very intimidating, you know. Um, but other than that, I, I wouldn't say that I get that intimidated. You know, yeah, I think intimidation definitely seeps in when you're not prepared. So if you're prepared, then right. I think you can, you know. That's, yeah, a, take that's a nugget reason. right there. Right, man. you know? Right? Yeah, you know? Yeah, if you know it, then you know it, right? There's, if you know it, nobody can take it from you. So, you know, you put in the time, you get to do sound check or rehearsal. You know, I mean, I think the vocalist, like I, when I play with Betty, but Betty can be intimidating, but she gave me the gig. But then from Betty in, in this whole thing, I start playing with Diane Reeves. Great, right? And I remember running to meeting Cassandra Wilson, who's one of my favorite singers. And she was just like, man, you know, I'd love to play with you. And I, and I remember being like scared, like, 
like, yeah, I don't think I want to play with you because you're like one of my favorite singers. And I don't want to, you know, I just don't want to go go there. Does that make sense? Yeah. In a way? Yeah. I mean, sometimes you want to keep them on that pedestal and have it just be that, you know, because sometimes it changes when you work with one of your favorite artists or you work with an artist or, you know, um, you work with an artist and then they, they turn out to be an asshole. And, you know, that clouds or that changes that whole way you look at yeah. them, you know. And that has happened too, but yeah, I try to, <laughs> you know, pick and choose. We were talking the other day and you were telling me you're about to go back to school. <laughs> or you just started. Started yesterday. What, I know, man. what inspired that choice? You're gonna do your masters in, in jazz composition? Well, I think temporary insanity, probably. This, I mean, you don't go to school at my age. No, um, <laughs> I am getting my masters in jazz performance. Um, Sounds to me like from all the things we've talked about, you got your masters in jazz uh, performance. Yeah, right, the, the, the yeah. <laughs> degree in the heart, uh, the School of Hard Knocks. Um, you know, I think with the, the way things are now, um, schools want you to have a degree in order to have you on their roster as, as a teacher. And so, um, you know, just softly testing the waters of getting a teaching gig, I learned that, yeah, a lot of the universities want a de degree. And then once I really, you know, I applied and then I got this wonderful fellowship, um, I started embracing the idea of what I could do with this, this, the next two years. And it gives me, it's, the way I'm looking at it is it's giving me a chance to wipe the slate clean or like to start again have a blank canvas. Like I really want to re-examine my technique, I want to re-examine my writing, I want to take the time and like just go through and like, you know, uh, go in and like hopefully fix issues and problems that you've had because musicians don't really talk about the issues. We don't have the time when we have a problem or something like that. We're just in work mode. We're touring, we're touring, we're touring, touring until we're not touring. So we don't have that time unless a teacher could maybe, uh, if a teacher takes a sabbatical, but with, um, the drums, you know, I was working so much that I didn't have time to go back and, and, and look at, okay, how am I soloing or like what's going on with my bass drum or what's going on with my right hand or left hand or whatever. So I'm taking this opportunity to really look at all of that. You know, so I'm embracing, I'm excited, mm -hmm. you know. I imagine ultimately if, if, you're, if you wind up teaching, I mean, that is obviously close to you as well and part of the, as I look at jazz, to me that, music in general, I, I think, mm. that really is part of what we do. It's even part of why I hope yeah. to be, you know, why I'm doing this is that I'm hoping to, you know, be able to pass something along and give people some insight into exactly. what it's about. Yeah, yeah. You, you'll be, be able to do that to a broader uh, group of people. People, I mean, I, I taught uh, Dave Douglas used to be the head of Banff Jazz mm -hmm. during the summer, um, and he did it for 10 years. And he asked me to do it one year, Right. and I didn't want to do it. He asked me and James Zenas to do it. I re you know, reluctantly said, yes, I'll do it. So that ended up turning into nine years for me. I was only supposed to do it once, but Dave... He, he liked the way that I taught also, and he invited me every, every year. So he did it 10 years, I did it nine years. I got, I got into teaching, I got into, yeah. and then I would, you know. Um, well, because there's different kinds of teachers, and, and I think many of them are important and, and have an important place, but the, there's not a lot of teachers who have the kind of professional experience that, that you have. Right. You know, right. the real world experience. Right, yeah. It doesn't mean that they're not great. It doesn't mean they can't give you a lot of information. Mm. But it's important when the folks who do it for real day in, day out, mm. you know, can tell you how it really is versus... Right. Is that how they imagine it being, yeah. or, you know, you know, it's hands-on experience. And as I, as I taught, I, I got better and better and better at it. And sure. Until it got to a point where, it's, man, I was just coming up with concepts or how I want to teach and how I explain what I do on the drums and explain uh, how to make music with others and, you know, just this whole thing. So it just kept evolving. 
And those nine years, I kept notes. Once again, not that I'm like this, this brainiac cat, but I you know, kept, kept notes. And um, yeah, I mean, so at the end, I mean, I felt like I was, okay, I'm really, I can teach, you know? So my wife was like, also, when we talked about me going to records, um, she's like, you know, you've been teaching all this whole time, so you might as well just go and get a degree right. and, and, and do it. And I was like, you were right. I mean, there's a lot of different, teachers out there in different ways of teaching. Um, but I do feel that what I have to offer and the way I'm coming from, there's definitely a place for that. Yeah. Well, listen, man, I want to close it out with this. When I called you and asked you if you wanted to do this, if you'd be willing to do this with me, right. you said to me, however I can help you, that's what we do, or something like that. Yeah. And I just thought, that's, that's man, true. first of all, I super, super appreciate it. Hmm. Uh, but I feel like that is also, that's kind of part of what we're talking about entirely, man. It's, you know, I, and that's, that's what I see in you as far as like, that's why I'm asking you about the tradition and, you know, because I feel like, I feel like that's what you're doing, man. You know, you're, you're, you're moving it along. I'm trying to, man. I mean, yeah, I, the only way that I, I know how and, and uh, I think it's definitely a positive thing and, and, and if we can continue this just worldwide, just even outside of music, just this, that, that helping each other, sharing information. Like I say, any, anything you need, I'm here. Any information anyone needs, they know they can always, you know, people write me through my website or whatever, mm -hmm. and I, I get back, I get back to them, you yeah. know? It's, um, yeah, I'm not trying to hide the information. Anything that I have, I feel that I can offer to you and uh, if it can help you or inspire you to do something, then yeah, I've been successful. Thank you. If you're digging what we're doing here on the channel, I would definitely appreciate if you would like and subscribe, do the notification bell, all the stuff that everybody asks you for on all the YouTube videos. It would be greatly appreciated. We're just getting started. A lot of content yet to come. Thanks for checking it out.